let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I know we're missing Mr. Mormon, but uh, he'll, be, he'll be with us shortly, I'm certain. I saw him coming in the door. Uh, and since we're starting late, let me begin by saying uh, thank everyone for their indulgence, uh, staff, students. We particularly apologize to you uh, for keeping you up even later. And uh, thank you, community, for your indulgence with the uh, later start time so that the board could, could attend a, a function with the uh, teaching staff. So, uh, I hereby call this uh, meeting, this regular meeting of Lake Forest Community High School District 115 to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Ms. Barrett? Mrs. Snowblum? Here. Mr. Mormon? Mr. Markison? Here. Mrs. Sorensen? Here. Mr. Schreiber? Here. Mr. Prowers? Here. Mr. Block? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, Ted, sorry. Just, we just got through the roll call, that's all. So please appropriately mark Mr. Mormon as here. Uh, we'll forego the president's report in the interest of time. And uh, Mr. Simic, I'll turn it over directly to you. Thank you, Mr. Block. And I will first hand off to Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Superintendent Simic. Um, I'm happy to announce that uh, last week we had our second annual E-Day. It's a great opportunity for our students and faculty uh, to break up the winter doldrums and enjoy each other's company, um, learn something new, uh, be creative. Uh, so we had an outstanding uh, theatrical troupe that came in uh, called Neo Futurist Theater. We had uh, lots of different activities from uh, students learning how to play the guitar, uh, learning how to cook for yourself, how to decorate your dorm room, lots of exciting things. Uh, I think all the students, fair to say, enjoyed and had a great day. Uh, we also just uh, finished our theatrical production of Antigone uh, and went extremely well, and so we're very excited about that. Uh, and getting excited uh, for our next musical, which is Sweeney Todd. So I know our kids are really excited about that. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Luke and Lena, who will talk a little bit about student activities. Hello, thank you for having us. Um, the first thing. Uh, the most recent event at our school was Turnabout. I know I talked about our plans for Turnabout at our last meeting, but it ended up being a huge success. We sold over 900 tickets, and out of all that, we raised $7,000 that, don that, that is donated to Greenwood Elementary, which has been our, our charity throughout the year. Um, it was very popular. Our new DJ, Jordan Wessel, uh, dropped some sweet beats <laughs> at Turnabout, and it was really fun. It was a different feel for everyone who has been there before, and I think everyone had a good time. Good evening, everyone. Please excuse my casual attire. I haven't had the time to go home and change, so I've been legging. Sorry. Um, so another thing on our list is we're having a school coat drive, which um, was brought to us by Senior, Senora Lev, who is a friend who's a teacher at a s public school in um, Chicago, so we are uh, raising, or we're uh, collecting coats to be donated to that school. And I think they're due tomorrow, right? So each uh, student council member has their own homeroom that they're in charge of, and all the coats will be donated tomorrow. Uh, lastly, um, we got news of a tragic event in Lake Forest um, of a family whose house burnt down. Um, I think their last name was the Bogdanwitz. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but um, we met with a couple other groups. I know Women's Club and Student Council are working together to match a few donations. Um, I think Women's Club was nice enough to donate, to match a donation of $300, and Sudco is going to add another 500 to that, and so we're going to put together a gift card for their family because uh, we know that they lost a lot of clothes and belongings in that fire. And hopefully they can replenish those, you know, to the best of their ability. And Croya as well is going to be donating money. So thank you to all those groups. And uh, that's all for today. So thank you. Um, and the final thing I'd like to talk about is just some of the progress that our faculty is making, uh, working on professional learning. Uh, and I want to relate them to some of our goals in terms of equity and access, documenting our curriculum, making it visible. Uh, we are. Work is being done in earnest to get ready for the 2015-16 school year where we'll have a full rollout in technology. 
So we're ramping up our efforts for technology training and opportunities for our teachers. Uh, we're sending a group of our science department, approximately half of our science department, to the National Science Teachers Association Conference next month. It's the first time in a while that the actual national conference has been held in Chicago. So it's a great opportunity. There, along, you've heard a lot about common core standards in terms of English and math. There's a whole other set of standards which uh, doesn't get as much press, but I'm very excited about, and that's the next generation science standards. So it's about making science exciting, real world relevant, and positioning our kids for success. Uh, we also have our Tri-District Day, which is coming up, which we're going to emphasize professional learning for the, th the three school districts in the area. And so a big emphasis that for that day is going to be on a formative assessment, um, having great tests uh, and other types of assessment going beyond the pencil and paper test where students are actually learning through the process. And so that's a whole brand new um, avenue that we're continuing to work on. So we're very excited about that and the work that we're doing at the school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. And you uh, have more to report, I take it, Mr. Three, Simmons. Yes, we have uh, three discrete parts to the superintendent's report tonight. Uh, part two is an update on a conference that I uh, very recently attended. And then part three will be Mrs. Whipple speaking to you about our climate survey and the results that uh, we got, uh, the participation that we got from that. So. Uh, the National School Board Association conference uh, was this past week, and uh, I, I know that uh, a number of you were interested in attending, and uh, things professionally and personally uh, intervened that made that uh, not possible. I did uh, attend, as I have in years past, and wanted to uh, bring you up to speed on what the, the major topics of the conference focused on. The first one is ESEA. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act is also, we know it as No Child Left Behind. Second topic, uh, near and dear to many of your hearts are underfunded or unfunded mandates such as IDEA. And uh, the last one, also very important, uh, related to uh, underfunded or unfunded mandates, and that is uh, local control and the issue of overreach, federal overreach. And in particular, it's the executive branch or uh, the Department of Education overreach in our in our case. We had a number of different meetings with uh, both of our senators' staffs and a, a number of congressmen and women across the Capitol. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting personally with Congressman Dold, uh, who was good enough to take a, a good deal of time and spend with us talking about uh, things that are important to us. So the uh, ESEA. Uh, is moving at lightning speed. This is uh, quoted directly from Senator Kirk's staff. Uh, this is a huge difference from even a year ago. Uh, in addition, if both chambers uh, uh, of, of the Congress are able to pass a bill, they do not expect to have a presidential veto on this. Of course, there's, there's a significant if there. Uh, another thing that was very good for us to hear is that uh, the National School Board Association has done a really good job of explaining issues that we've had for many years on testing. And that testing is uh, the requirement that all students grade three through eight and then one time in high school take a test annually. And in the practice of measuring and then first, uh, first measuring, then publishing, and then punishing schools. In particular, uh, one of the things is in an, in an evidence-based world that we live in, uh, is education that uh, is particularly irksome, that education has sanctions on it that are not research-based, things like the firing or the replacement of the principal of the building or converting the school to a charter school. Uh, the underfunded or unfunded mandates, is very happy to see Senator Harkin introduce a bill that for the first time would fully fund IDEA. And for, for those of you who may not be as familiar uh, with this as, as some others, IDEA came into being in 1976 with the hope that it one day it would be funded at a 40% level. This past year we were at 17.5%. The current year's budget from the President uh, anticipates it dropping to 16%. And so what that means is that of the cost of special education, the federal government will contribute 16 cents on the dollar. With uh, Senator Harkin's bill that would, over 10 years, rise to 40 cents on a dollar and fulfill 
that, uh, that, that initial ambition. What's important to hear locally for us is that in a just, just in the past eight years, our district is $26.9 million between the elementary district and the high school district underfunded. That's just in the past eight years on special education alone. And uh, obviously, if we were to go from 16% funding to 40% funding, one of the reasons that I'm encouraging our board to, to be engaged on this is that that means huge, huge amounts of dollars that would then come to us that we are currently levying locally and spending locally. So our residents in that eight year period have paid on average about $2,250 per household uh, for this one un underfunded mandate. Uh, the issue of overreach, one of the nice things to hear from Senator Kirk's staff was, hey, you guys have talked about this before, and I brought an artifact. This is an artifact from District 67, and it is uh, about an inch thick, and it is uh, from a Dear Colleague letter from the Office of Civil Rights within the Office of the Department of Education. So it's one uh, office within one department sends a letter to us and we do this uh, each district does this every other year and in district 67 i brought this along to leave with them this is one of the artifacts that did have a, a real impact there are 28 people that are required to put this report together every principal every secretary every assistant principal and uh, personnel ranging from the superintendent to the data manager there are three pages worth of data polls that have to be done to complete this one request. Now there's no funding that goes along with this. And the data polls range from what is your enrollment to what is your ethnic enrollment by district and by school, how many gifted and talented students do you have, how many limited English proficiency students do you have by ethnicity, by grade, by school, math and science classes, enrollment in Algebra one. Uh, students with IEPs, students with 504s, how many students passed Algebra 1 in grades 7 or 8? Now what's required for this is that we have to have a, uh, some person, happens to be a secretary in this case, go into individual teachers' grade books and then find out who passed. And we have to determine what passing means for us and then count them individually. We also have to create five different spreadsheets to comply with this and in the end the final product is to complete all of these various forms. And this is one request from one department within the Department of Ed. And this is an example, one of the best examples of administrative overreach and one of the prime topics that the National School Board Association is bringing uh, to the Capitol saying this really needs to stop. Now what's important about this for the future is that this Dear Colleague letter is, is, represents one of four Dear Colleague letters that have been written to date. They have 24 additional Dear Colleague letters planned. So there is a call to action that, that I believe is, uh, is very important for our board because I had a, a great deal of time to spend with our leaders in Illinois uh, the president of the school board association, the executive director of the school board association, and got to learn about what's happening in Illinois. So it's not just on a, a national level, it's also on a state level, very real things. So in this case, uh, Senate, Senate Bill 16 was introduced last year and it is a, the quintessential Robin Hood proposal, which is to take from districts like Lake Forest and then uh, redistribute that income to others. That bill, uh, Senate Bill 16, has been reintroduced with a new number and a different name already this year. There are two major issues I see with that. The first is the, the proposal is to bring down the top, so to reduce Lake Forest's ability to have the kind of schools that it wants in favor of redistributing that income to other less funded schools. Now, bringing the bottom up is something that few people think is a bad idea. Um, obviously revenue money isn't the only solution uh, the, or the only problem or the only solution for those districts problems but bringing down the top I think is a terrible idea. The biggest issue and I think we would have a tremendous amount of company in this is advocating that this type, type of solution requires Springfield to gain 
authority and therefore control over local school districts. That usurps and, and infringes upon the control of a local school board. And I think there are very few people that would say that that is a good idea. There are a couple ways uh, for our board to get engaged. One of them coming up very soon, there's an Alliance Leadership Summit on the 17th and 18th, that's in Springfield. And this is an all Illinois uh, summit. The governor will be speaking at that. There'll be chances to, to meet with local legislators there. There's also a, a smaller venue, and that is the Lake Division Dinner on March 11th. But there are going to be many opportunities. I really expect that the Robin Hood proposal that was introduced last year, these things typically have a cycle. It's two, three, or four years before they get these things evolved to the point where you have groundbreaking changes. And what I really think that it's important for us to do as, uh, as community leaders in this is to be a part of that discussion because we will either be at the table for those discussions or quite literally we will be on the table. Uh, so with that, that ends this portion of the superintendent's report. And Mrs. Whipple, would you like to give a brief su summary on our survey? Well, Mrs. Whipple, he left you a lot of room for upside with his parting on the table comments. So I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you'll brighten our mood just Thank a little you, bit. Thank you, Mr. Simic. <laughs> I had just a brief report at this point. Uh, we did launch the survey on January 20th and closed it last Friday on schedule, which was February 6th. We were very pleased with that. Um, it did go to all staff, all students, as well as to parents uh, in the high school district. Just as an aside, we also did the same survey at District 67 in grades three through eight, and then all educators and all parents too. But tonight I'll just give you a quick little synopsis of where we are with the high school uh, survey. <coughs> we did launch it the first week, our returns were pretty slow, so we pulled in all the stops and worked hard to work with some of our leaders. I'd like to thank Mr. Rogers and his leadership team. Um, our LFEA leaders also helped, and the one that I think moved the needle probably the strongest was we called all of our parent leadership groups and asked them to canvas their membership as well and actually doubled participation on that. So just quickly, our student response rate uh, was right close to 90, uh, 88.5, which was good. We started out with a 91% uh, response rate, but after they uh, survey it for four minutes or less or response patterns that show it was someone who quickly went through it, they pull out a few. So not much of a change, so we think it was a good response from our students. The staff rate, we're pleased to say, was 65.2%, which is really a very nice, healthy response rate. And then our parents, which doesn't sound as healthy, but it was at 22.3, but knowing that we were at 6% in previous surveys, you know, we've more than tripled the response rate, so we're very pleased with that. The next steps are that within about two to three weeks, we'll receive a very comprehensive report. Some of you have actually seen reports from the past. Uh, that will give us our areas of strength as well as our areas for improvement, and we'll be able to make some informed decisions and go forward. At that point, obviously, we'll share all the report results with you as well as the constituents that responded, and then our teams will look for action items and work uh, to implement some ideas for change and improvement within the districts for culture and climate. Are there any questions? No, th just to remind you, this is a nationally norm test, so we were unable to manipulate the questions, if you will, but in subsequent tests, I think we should identify areas that we would like to go broader and then have some sections that are probably a little more school specific, but I think we're gonna have great benchmark and starting results from this first sampling, and we're very pleased with the response. Good. Well, we, re we look forward to receiving the results. And I, I know there's also been discussion about having a comment session, section, excuse me, as right. part of the survey. This we did discuss that at this point. They suggested we start this first round without. But I think that we can craft questions and have an area that has much more open-ended open and more school-specific for subsequent years. And I think that should be a goal for our district. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Does that conclude the superintendent's report? Okay, it's now time for public participation then. Uh, looking out in the audience, uh, I don't think there's anyone from the public who would care to comment, but in case there is, please step forward and we would welcome anything you have to say. Seeing no one, let's uh, move on then to uh, reports. And I understand we uh, have our annual report on uh, college acceptance and attendance.
I'd like to thank Mr. Maher and uh, his, his staff for um, pulling this together. Mr. Naughton is also uh, joining him and, and uh, probably will entertain questions at, at the end of this. This is, as I have spoken with Mr. Maher uh, earlier, I should say Dr. Maher at yeah. this point. <laughs> and uh, belated congratulations well, thank you. on that. <laughs> very good. So Dr. Maher is, uh, is aware of the very keen interest that the board has in, uh, in uh, this presentation each year. And I know uh, President Block has been uh, uh, curious to see what this looks like each year. And this is one of the, the highlights for us because oh, one wonderful. of the things that, that jumps out is while uh, 85 students apply uh, or are accepted at uh, the, the uh, Indiana University, which is an 85% acceptance rate. There are only nine students who wind up going there. And so I know the counseling department really works hard at uh, finding the right place for students. And there's a very wide dispersion of students. And that's a, one of the interesting trends, or I shouldn't say a trend, a pattern mm -hmm. of, of the information year after year. So with that, Mr. Dr. Maher. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present, uh, again, a, our results and information from the class of 2014. Also in this presentation, we'll, Brad and I will provide some information about what the Student Services Department has been up to uh, with the new leadership in the, in the group. But I want to thank Brad Naughton for joining me today. Brad is one of our uh, academic college counselors. Uh, he is the resident expert, and so uh, I have a lot of this information. But Brad, also, if you've got some um, detailed questions at the end of the presentation, Brad, I'll, Brad, I'm sure, can handle some of those questions. So without any delay, we'll get started. So as, as you can see, uh, this, the format, the first few slides, is similar to what's been uh, presented in the past. These particular numbers, these are the uh, number of students who have applied and the number of students who have been accepted, so an acceptance rate to the most popular public institutions. And these numbers I found to be reasonably stable, uh, relatively stable. There's a newcomer in this group, Auburn University, has been attracting uh, more applications. This particular group of uh, schools, again, the high acceptance rates compared relative to all of the other schools on our lists and then also the large number of students who do apply and so these are and again as I said the the numbers for Indiana University uh, Iowa U of I at Champaign-Urbana University of Missouri and Miami University those are all very stable numbers over time and then again Auburn has been has crept into this group okay and then a similar uh, dynamic for the private institutions. And again, Denver, Dayton, Marquette, DePaul, and DePaul in Greencastle, Indiana. Again, these are very stable. These have been the, top, the most popular schools to apply to. And also, uh, we have a strong acceptance rates to these schools. And again, like I said, these have, been, this is, these have been pretty stable over the past, I went back two or three years, and these schools are pretty stable in this rating. Again, this, pre this presentation is on available online, so if it's difficult to see at the pr current time, uh, the, this information is available on the, the board's page of the website. We also present to here the class of 2014 acceptance rates of a number of pri uh, public schools as compared to a five-year rate, and also finding some uh, national acceptance rates. As you see, we're pretty similar to uh, the rates that are you know, across the national averages. In a couple of cases though, uh, take Indiana University, our rates are stronger. That is a out of state rate of 74% for the Indiana University. So where I could find the data for out of state acceptances, I, I, I use that data. University of Missouri, Columbia, that is their overall rate of 81 from the US News. And of our students, we get 70% 70, 70 of the kids ex, uh, accepted into the school. That has also become a, a, a growing uh, population of you know, popular school to go to. My understanding is that the population in the state of Missouri is actually decreasing. And this is a way for the state to attract new people into the state. 
And there's also a very favorable residency rate if the student stays on campus for 12 months. Their rate, the tuition goes to the state level, and the in-state rate. And so there's, uh, again, I suspect one of the reasons for the rise in popularity of that particular school. And then also a similar demographic for, similar numbers for uh, private universities. Again, we have a wide variety. Some of these schools are, again, are more popular and with high acceptance rates. And also some of the schools that are um, more challenging to get into. But again, as you see across the board, our students are accepted at a rate that's equal and sometimes higher than the national rate for many of these private universities. This is a particular slide that I want to take some time to explain because it looks like a list of just a bunch of schools. And, and I want to show the variety of schools that our counselors guide our students to. And certainly we have, you know, again, as I mentioned here, there's 39 states across the, across the nation where our kids go to schools. They certainly have large campus life, like Ohio State University, where it has an undergrad population of about 40,000. And our kids also attend very small schools, the University of Dallas, Claremont McKenna College. These are schools that are sometimes smaller than Lake Forest High School. And so we have a wide range in size of schools. We have urban schools like New York University, and then we have out west, uh, so one, one of my favorite stories about a student attending the University of Wyoming because of having the best trout fishing river running through the middle of campus. And so I just, you know, I, there's a wide variety of, of reasons for uh, students to choose these different schools. DigiPen Institute of Technology in Washington has been in existence for about 10 years, a very highly technical school, computer science, gaming theory, and uh, game creation again, as compared to a traditional liberal arts school like Middlebury, a school like West Point, where they have one of the finest leadership academies uh, programs coming out of that school, obviously a military school with a lot of structure. And Brad has in told, described Colorado College as a very individualized school. A student takes one course at a time for three or four weeks until its completion, and then starts a brand new course. So a wide range of what a philosophy of a school can provide. Concordia University in Wisconsin is a religiously affiliated school. Lewis and Clark College in Oregon has no religious, and so there's a wide range of, again, religious affiliations where our kids choose to go to. One of the nice things as I was going through all this data, 413 kids that went to school from the class of 200, uh, 400, I'm sorry, of 2014, 160 different schools were chosen. I think that's quite a widespread. That's not funneling these kids to the same schools every year. Our counselors uh, have a wide range of choices to help kids get into those schools. And again, here are some pretty simple numbers about actual numbers of kids that attended from the class of 2014 to these particular universities. No surprise, the University of Illinois is at the top of the list. Miami University, again, also at close to the top. And as you can see, scrolling down, these are all public universities. College of Lake County, also we sent 27 students are attending there from Lake Forest from the class of 2014. Private schools, Marquette's very popular. High Point University, a small school in North Carolina. Again, has a need for our students, fits the needs for our students, and so we're able to send a number of kids there. And, and Brad can help me out here also. And so this, these are some four areas that I just want to touch on very briefly. These are areas of, of the, that I'm very proud of the work that the student services have, gone, have uh, been involved with. Each counselor is on a core team helping out with students that are having difficulty at the, at the school. It's amazing the level of understanding of student life that the counselors have. They work with kids, they try to find help, they, they call, there's great communication with the homes, again, to help kids be successful. We have a, gr we have a growing uh, limited English proficiency population. We're testing, currently testing eight students with a ELL national assessment that's a state-funded test, again, so we can provide the services they need so they can be successful. That provides wonderful opportunities for instruction and uh, for our students to, to, to have that diversity in our school. 
We're, we're currently in the middle also of collecting middle school recommendation and placement data. Uh, we've improved that. We, again, we have a wonderful team within the, the department that has helped me uh, improve some of our data collection process. And then finally, Alumni Tracker, uh, which is connected to our Naviance program, which will allow us to extend the data, this particular report, as we learn and gather more data uh, and complete the data that we have, have found already, I think we'll, react, we'll, we'll move to a, a model of where have the kids not only gone to school, but have they graduated in four years, have they graduated in five years? What, is that, what was that student's program at Lake Forest High School that led to some correlations of how long it took them to graduate? And those are some programs that I'm very excited about bringing to you in the future, future as we gather that data over time, that longitudinal data. And Brad, I think you have a couple of, can you describe some of, some of our department goals? Brad Knott. Um, thanks for having me back. Uh, last year, I think we spoke a little bit about, or I spoke a little bit about um, initiatives last year, mostly focused around registration and particularly eighth grade registration. Um, at the end of last school year, we met as a group and, and decided that we really wanted to focus this school year on the physical act of the application itself for our seniors. Um, you know, we, we sit back and we know that these kids are busy in, in their regular lives. I mean, um, we have seniors that show up for a board meeting at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, and they're going to be back in school tomorrow at 7.50. They're playing sports, they're in drama, and then we know as a society and through the college process, we take this application process and, and dump them on that while they're trying to hold all that together also. So we really focused on, our focus was really three things. One, the college essay itself, which is a huge piece and tends to be pretty laborsome. The physical act of filling out the application, in particular the common application online, which is becoming um, really kind of the standard. Uh, and then financial aid and scholarships. So what we, some of the things we put in place is this summer, um, Megan Miles and Emily Pickens uh, had a summer workshop for seniors on the writing the college essay. Um, fairly well attended, we, trying to give the kids a head start, um, get that essay, get things on paper, um, coming into the school year, something they could take to their English teachers, get another set of eyes on, um, and, get, and kind of get started. The, um, the physical act of the application we, we saw as being a little more complex, so we also looked at the concept of our College Resource Center and what is the use of the College Resource Center. And, and the College Resource Center is on our first floor. It's managed by Jennifer Gleason. She does a fabulous job with it. And our kids identified, when we talked to them, they identified the College Resource Center as a place that hosts college visits. And we kind of stepped back and said, for that purpose, it's fabulous, but should it be more? And we call it a resource center as if, just like we call the Math Resource Center, is a place to go get help. So one of the things that we did is, uh, we've, Jennifer, with, Jennifer's put in a, a lion's share of the work here, but we've, um, kind of redesign the room, first of all, to make it more student friendly, a, a place where students can stop in, in theory, to get help, like they would in math if they had a question they couldn't answer. Um, the other thing that we did is we put out student announcements that it would be manned by a counselor during the lunch period. So we divided up time through the lunch periods and left the resource center open to student walk-in for questions, and, and as we posed it to the kids, questions on college essays, the application process itself, filling out the application. Um, and for example, I, I manned it one, one lunch period and a student walked in and, and it wasn't my student, very similar again to the Math Resource Center, I'm, it doesn't have to be your math teacher. But the student was, the question was, Mr. Naughton, I can't go any farther in my comment app, it won't let me advance. And the question was, the problem ultimately was, and it was a 30 second solution, the question on the comment app was, how many other high schools have you attended? Student answered one. Well, they've spent their entire career at Lake Forest High School. The answer actually is zero. The program won't let them advance because they were waiting for another high school name. We delete one, enter zero, done, solved, moving on. Okay? So, but the kid looked at me and said, I've been working on this for a week. Okay, well, that's a week wasted. So that, that was the second kind of focus. The third one was really financial aid and ultimately scholarships. So uh, Laura Stetson, 
fabulous new counselor reached out to ISAC, and they are really Illinois' version of experts in the actual application of filling out the FAFSA um, for free financial aid. We are hosting four events on our campus where parents and students can come in with their W-2s or tax returns, sit down with an expert and a laptop, and actually do their FAFSA on site. Um, two of the nights are in the evening, trying to be as user-friendly to parents as we can, um, and to just eliminate roadblocks from kids of getting the applications done and getting into college. Uh, lastly, last Friday, Jen Gleason and the Resource Center sent an email to every senior with um, our local scholarships listed, links to the applications, and where they can be found in Naviance. Description, who can apply for them, how do you apply for them, where are the essays, what's the reward amount, et cetera. So um, we're hoping that this process makes this more manageable for our, our kids, particularly our seniors, to, to fill out applications, get accepted to college, pay for college, go to college, and then maintain their regular lives and just be senior kids. And you only get one chance to be a senior in high school, and it shouldn't be that stressful. So um, that's this year's initiative. So, uh, any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many um, scholarships are out there, but how, how would you help a, a, a parent or a student navigate all of the potential scholarships that are available? Do you have right. to go, do you have to narrow the schools down first and then see which scholarships they have? I mean, what, is there a programmatic way? Um, when, I talk, when I talk to students or parents about scholarships, I, I, I kind of, actually, I, go, I step back and I talk, I, I actually say money, okay? Because it, it, it's more than just scholarships. I mean, one, there's the concept of, of the FAFSA itself. And the question of lots of parents is, well, we don't feel like we'll qualify, should we apply? And the answer is always yes, right? Okay? And that actually some schools actually will not consider a student for a scholarship unless they've, in fact, filled out the FAFSA. All right, so... Then there's the concept of merit-based money, and then there's the, um, and we talked to kids about that. Now, the answer to your question is, is where does that come from? The institution itself, commonly, the college itself, and, and they don't typically hide that. So if you go, and I tell students this, if you, you pull up the University of Illinois' website or in, really virtually any colleges, and you type in the search box scholarships, they're gonna pop up and they're gonna be listed. And many times the criteria is listed there too certain GPA, certain ACT, but then there's other ones tied to leadership and things, and it's a little bit of, you have to know yourself and where would I qualify. Um, so that, that's one angle. Um, for us, there's the local scholarships too, and that's things like APT and legal and voters, et cetera. Generally speaking, when, when, we, when you talk about merit-based aid, which I, I think is what you're kind of generally talking about, um, again, it's not hidden, it's there, it, it, and the schools publicize it, but the other aspect is to think, um, we can look in Naviance and see a typical ACT and GPA range for a school admittance. And if you see yourself over that range, it's pretty common to think that you, you're very attracted to them and that one way to attract you is in fact to try to, to entice you with, with merit-based money, okay? Um, because they're, they're trying to round out a class, they're trying to round out their school and that makes you a very hot commodity, I guess. So many times that's, that's our discussion is, okay, here are you, here's the admissions numbers, here's your numbers, let's, let's go to the school and investigate where this merit-based money could come from. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question which is dialing back a little bit. Okay. We talk about the top, of, you know, the attendance at certain schools. How many schools are our children applying to on average? It's up from past years. I, I think this is my 22nd year at the high school, and we used to talk about that number being somewhere around five to seven. Um, I would tell you it's now probably more between nine to 11. Um, some of that's just ease, though, too. When I first started, the Common App didn't exist. Um, so that's, you know, it's an application that's generally accepted by 400 schools. Um, and also, I think this, the landscape has changed, the competitiveness uh, of many of the schools, um, and so students feel a need of protection um, to apply to a few more, particularly, you know, we talk a lot about uh, a safety school, a target school, and a reach, and sometimes kids are adding in, in some of those um, safeties. Um, and then becoming enticed sometimes with, in fact, scholarship money, <laughs> and um, so they are adding in, adding in a few more schools. 
Um, you know, we, we would like to keep it in around that number, frankly. I think when anytime you start getting higher that, the, the water gets pretty muddy. And um, we, we, we meet with all of our juniors and their parents coming up. We're going to finish registration in about a month and a half, and then we'll start a process meeting with all of our juniors and their parents. And we talk about that process of, of having, um, first of all, criteria, what you're looking for, many times size, location, things like that, and then trying to build a, a base of schools around that criteria and keeping that, that number manageable now before it becomes unmanageable later. Because um, it's not as emotional now. It becomes very emotional when the decisions start coming in and particularly acceptances because you have your natural reaction, I think, is generally, well, someone accepted me, I'm going to accept them. And it, you, you don't have all your information yet. Step back and slow down. So. Um, I noticed uh, when you showed the slides that gave our um, 2014 acceptance rates and then the five-year average, our five-year average for that, um, there, some schools, were, they were very consistent and in some there was a fair amount of difference. I noticed for University of Michigan in particular, there was a, a 15 percentage point difference, I think. Um, on a one-year basis, you wouldn't want to draw any conclusions from that, I'm sure, but what do you do if you see a, a declining trend in our acceptance rates at a particular school? Is there a way that you can find out whether they're looking for something different than they used to be, or what do you do? Mm -hmm. uh, well, her name's Sally Lindsay, and I spoke to her today, <laughs> um, and she's the, our admissions rep from University of Michigan. Um, and we. I did not call specifically about your question, but about another one, but it led into a conversation actually regarding yours. Um, they, they, have, they are up in their applicant pool um, to the point that um, they even feel it's a little unmanageable. Um, and so they have, in fact, become a little more uh, selective, to be honest with you. Um, and, so in that regard, the discussion was between us um, still how she views our high school and our, our classes and our curriculum. And we actually got into a conversation about our um, contemporary Chicago writers class and how tremendous she thinks that, that class is and that's you know, taught at many colleges and we had a great discussion. Um, I don't think she necessarily, well, I know from our discussions, she doesn't view our students any differently, our curriculum any differently, or our school any differently. Um, they're just dealing with new numbers and they're trying to get a handle on their, their change it, changing numbers. And the best part of that answer was that you had a person there who you know and who knows you and who you can follow up with. I'm sure that can't be true at every single school our students apply to, but I'm glad to hear that you do have those relationships. The, the other piece of that is that the number of our students that apply to University of Michigan is also increasing. And so, so there's a, which is, there's nothing wrong with more kids applying. And so there's not, no reason to limit that. So that's, that's the, as the denominator of that, that fraction, that's a, you know, another factor involved with it besides what Brad's saying. Well, I would just, I, you know, I, I remember this from last year too. I mean, one of the things too is more students could classify Michigan as a stretch school than a target school or a safety school. So, mm -hmm. you know. If I, for example, would apply to Michigan, it clearly would be a stretch school in my criteria. So you, you may end up with a larger percentage of kids that, you know, gee, John, you didn't have a shot of getting in anyway, but you went ahead and applied right. and it's reflected in the data. Agree, I agree with that. I, of course, went to the University of Missouri and I don't really see Mr. Schreiber's school up there anywhere <laughs> being a Kansas grad. So uh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> Mr. Naughton, uh, one of the things that uh, I really appreciate working with you is uh, the, the, the amount of travel that not only you but all mm -hmm. of your colleagues do and the, uh, the range of places you know, all across the United States. And one of the observations that was recently shared, uh, and, and I believe this is held by the entire department, is that uh, these colleges, uh, our kids used to chase these colleges, and mm -hmm. increasingly these colleges are chasing our kids. Correct. Can you talk about that phenomenon? Uh, I mean, they, um, well, they see our students as good products, um, and, and I think a lot of that goes back to really the origins of 
their freshman English class and, and the, their their math class and, and uh, being challenged and prepared when they walk out walk out the door and that again back to the discussion with Michigan the, the the talk about the you know one particular class that she that she knows that's on our transcript and what that class is and um, so I think the concept that the colleges look at our kids they know that they've they've read they've they've written and, and they've been held to, to high standards they they're used to um, one bit balancing busy schedules that they're going to take on when they leave here they they have um, they've done homework they they've they understand a work ethic also i think there's there's things particularly particularly with the private schools um so many of our kids are, are doing so many things they're they're volunteering they're in plays they're in sports and a lot of those smaller private schools um in particular they they it's really really important for them to create a community and that i i think our kids are really attracted from that standpoint is um you know, I, I, I have a freshman now at the, at the high school, and I, I keep telling him, the talent show's coming. Wait till you see this thing. It's, gonna, it's crazy. The kids are going to be there. The talent's unbelievable. It's an exciting time at our school. And um, those kids go off to other places and contribute in ways in and out of the classroom that are highly attractive to the schools. So I, I infer from our conversations before and also from, from this one that if our students are willing to look at schools that are beyond brand names, for example, that they're going to be really, really uh, attractive to those colleges and there'll be additional opportunities for them in terms of merit aid and so forth. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, um, again, we're back to that. We, we have a really good product. We have really well prepared kids who are attractive to schools and schools are going to do what they can to to attract those strong candidates um, because of what they can actually bring to a campus. Um, and I, I think particularly for the smaller Labarde schools, um, that can be really profound when you're talking about a campus of two to 3,000 students um, where um, they, they can reach in and have influence in a, in a lot of different areas and then on a lot of different people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, I went to a small liberal arts school and I, I tell the kids that, you know, I, I, I took a class with, with six students and you can have a pretty big impact on, on, on six other kids um, and whether you did your reading or not, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they know, <laughs> so. Yeah, there's, it, it's obviously an individual decision because sure. some kids really thrive in a large school, but there, um, there's really something to be said for being a big fish in a small pond, and yeah. I think a lot of our kids are really ideally positioned for that. Mm -hmm. There are schools out there that they've probably never even heard yet who really, really want them and who are willing to give them money to go there, and uh, you know, parents need to know that as well. It may not be a school you've heard of. It may mm -hmm. not be the school you're going to be going around town, you know, showing off your t-shirt, but mm -hmm. You're going to you're going to get a very high quality liberal arts education at a fraction of the cost that you might have paid somewhere else. And by the way, your child is going to be in a smaller and more nurturing environment. Mm -hmm. It's um, you know we've and had I, good experiences with that ourselves, and, sure. and a lot of other parents have said the same to me. Just be open minded. I, I think too it becomes really relevant when you start looking at the number of our kids who who look at postgraduate educations, and and how individualized that process can be also. Um, so, um, not to try to oversimplify it, I kind of described to the kids the, the difference, you know, when they're, you know, do you want to be a kid who paints your face and goes to the game on Saturday, or are you looking for a smaller setting? And I, I know that oversimplifies it, but that's something that one way to describe to the kids. One more question, maybe, I think. Um, if, are we tracking the graduation um, rate for, so we may be getting in 61% at University of Colorado, but do we have a sense for how many are actually graduating in four years, for example? Yeah, the college get graduation rate. Yes, um, so in, this, in, the, in the alumni tracker data that, I, that we received, uh, we, we connected with that database 2009 up to the 2014. So 2009, 2010 classes uh, can have graduated. And so, so we have uh, preliminary numbers from those classes. The, the problem with the system is that there is 
15% of the data is not reported. And so we need to go to a second tier of, and, and simply stated, maybe it's just a survey, a local survey of those same kids to, so that we can update that data. So we do have preliminary data, but it's not complete. Um, I've gone back and looked at uh, the, the Department of Ed statistics. In general, about 60% about, about of kids, or 6 of kids graduate in six years or less. And so I would use that as a benchmark for us right now. Uh, we're, we're at that benchmark with this incomplete data, and if we, when we fill in the gaps of it, I think we'll be, it'll be you know, much more presentable. But, not, but as far as your initial question is, yes, we are beginning to, to track that. One, just one last question. Is there anything that prevents, um, so if I don't meet the criteria for an application at the University of Wisconsin, but I send it in anyway, that I'm assuming that's reflected in here, right? So I don't have a high enough ACT score, but I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping. Yes. Right, so yes. It's, it's more than a stretch. The reality is you're not gonna get in, but you went ahead and sent an application in anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the total number of applications spread out are increasing for the school because as Brad said, the number per student is increasing. And so maybe, maybe the actual acceptance rate isn't that important to us. It's more of, again, the graduation rate is a much more significant number. And so we are excited about what this data can, uh, the potential of the data can bring us. And I would add to that in my own personal experience, which goes back some years now, as Mr. Norton well knows. Uh, I think the uh, counseling department works very hard to, uh, to try to encourage students and parents to apply at for lack of better terminology, appropriate schools. Uh, yes, there's gonna be stretch schools, uh, you know, and, and, and we can all aspire to those kinds of things, but if it's a clear mismatch, I, I know your advice to me was always, you know, you're really better off not, not going there and, and trying to find opportunities that, uh, you know, will reward the student and, and, you know, provide a better environment for them longer term, so. I think it is one of the strengths. I, I'd like to go on and say, you know, I really appreciate your including the alumni tracker discussion here. Mr. Simic and I have had a number of conversations over the years. Uh, one of the things that's always interested me, and I think a large uh, portion of the community, and the parent community in particular, uh, about this annual report, it is, is that it is the most visible reflection of student outcome mm -hmm. that we have. We talk often, and sometimes even cavalierly, uh, about student outcome is our primary motivation and what have you, but we really don't have very good benchmarks uh, for measuring that. And this is uh, always been, uh, you know, the nearest term, most visible uh, benchmark that exists. And, and I applaud uh, the staff uh, in, you know, trying to dig deeper and find other ways to give the community and the board insight into student outcomes and how well we are doing uh, with, our, with our students. So I see it as a growing area of interest, obviously, and, and, and providing shading behind just, you know, the details of how many kids applied here and how many were accepted and how many initially went. The last comment I'd make uh, is that I presume, I know historically there's a lot more detailed data available to everybody on the website and, and through uh, the various software packages that we have, and uh, I would encourage the parent community to, to go there. Even if you're a freshman parent, uh, it's never too soon to begin this process. Uh, speaking as a parent of four, you naively think, I believe, that this is something that you, you get better and better at as, you know, the second, third, fourth. My own personal experience is four one-time experiences. <laughs> it's not an additive thing. It's, it's sort of a serious thing, so I would encourage our parents to get involved uh, uh, sooner, and I would encourage them in particular to take advantage of these new new programs that the high school is offering uh, that you mentioned, Brad, with regard to uh, essay, college essay writing, and, and FAFSA in particular, because those are not simple endeavors, and to wait till the fall of your senior year to begin to go down that road just adds a lot of pressure and a lot of uh, anxiety to the situation that doesn't need to be there. So thank you all both very much. Thank Any you. Any further comments or questions? Nope. Okay.
let's uh, let's move on then. If I can get back to the agenda. Uh, the next thing here is our uh, board committee reports. Uh, Mrs. Snowblin, the Board Education Committee. Yes, the Education Committee met last uh, Wednesday, February 4th at 7.30 in the morning and our um, two topics of conversation were, um, first was final exams and the school calendar. Um, the board has already approved a school calendar and um, Ms. Fagel and Mr. Rogers were giving us a little bit more background on how we ended up where we ended up, which which was a, a good place. It's just that there's been a lot of discussion over the years about um, rearranging the school calendar a little bit so that finals can fall before winter break. There are a lot of benefits to students in um, in doing that, but of course there are some sacrifices as well, one of which would be that um, school would have to start earlier. So there was serious consideration given to that. Um, for a lot of families, as Mr. Rogers pointed out, uh, August is really important family time. Um, you know, they may get together with their extended family or, or whatever. Um, so it's a difficult thing to ask them to give up some of that so that kids can get back into school earlier. Um, on the other hand, uh, about 700 of our students are enrolled in fall sports, and many of those already are in practices before school starts, so those kids have to be back at school anyway. So. Um, for the, the near future, we're not making any significant change there, but uh, it did launch some good discussions um, um, among the staff, and we understand that um, those discussions are going to continue. And in addition, um, it created a, a context for discussing final exams themselves and why we give them and what value they are and what teachers actual practices are because all of us have probably had kids who said oh yeah well you know my teacher's really not doing a final or you know we're going to have an in-class final or whatever so um, I think there's going to be a lot more discussion among the staff and the faculty about um, what we are really currently doing about finals and whether there's a better way to um, to handle them and make sure that we're getting um, information that's of, valuable, of value for the, the debe development of our students and not just something that they you know, really stress out about over the entire winter break and then come back and they've you know, forgotten everything they're going to be tested on. So um, that was one of our topics. And then the other was a presentation on um, new courses that are being offered, both summer school classes, and there are um, for the first time in, in several years, there are a lot of uh, credit classes being offered over summer school and the catalog was released early so that families would have more opportunity to consider how those might fit into their students' plans for the, for the coming year. And then um, in addition, we went over about, I think probably eight new um, classes that are being offered in the fall uh, catalog, some of which I would personally very much like to enroll in, but I'm afraid I, I've, I've aged out. so. That's not a possibility, but they sound terrific. In some cases, they replace or combine existing classes in, um, in logical ways, and uh, we thought that they, um, they all sounded really, uh, really pretty exciting, and we hope our teachers are, are excited about them as well. Um, and that was about it. Our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, April 8th, also early in the morning. Um, other board members at that meeting were Mr. Markison and Ms. Sorensen. Do either of you have anything to, to add? Nope. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Uh, I had, just real quick, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Block. Um, Nikki, um, informal request, because this, you know, I've uh, probably a half dozen times over the holidays got peppered with the same thing around school start time and finals and um, maybe if we could put together a list, I'd be interested to see what schools do start early within our kind of, you know, North Shore area or even the Northwest suburbs. N nothing that needs to be, I think, reported back here at the board or at least not at this point, but it'd be interesting to see what that benchmark looks like because I think several schools made changes last fall where they started a week early some start a week early and seem to have finals before we say in order to do that we may need to start two weeks early so there's a lot of confusion on that i'd be i'd love to get your input 
especially as somebody that's been running the education committee for, for as long as you have, just kind of what your thoughts are with some of that. Um, well, I want to emphasize that this is not the same, th and, and I know you're not thinking this, but this is not the same thing as when we talked about revamping the school day. However, there are some similarities in, in that there, there's not one other solution. It's not we do it this way or we do it this way. There are, are a number of different approaches that can be taken. And you're right. Does it have to mean starting two weeks early? early? Could it mean starting one week early? And I think the answer to that is yes, it could. Um, I believe we were told that there are other districts in the area that have made that change, but I don't have any specific data on that, and I'm sure that we can ask for that to be um, to be produced. But I, I also think that it's um, it, it may just not be a change that can be made in, in one year. So, for example, let's say, you know, we have a lot of families who, you know, the third week in August every year, they, you know, they go to, uh, you know, Door County or whatever, you know, they meet family, whatever. You can't just say to them, okay, next year you can't do that. Um, so this may need to be a little bit more of an evolution. Um, there was also some discussion of that, of the possibility of not actually changing the schedule, or at least not by, not by two weeks, but basically completing the curriculum for the first semester before the winter break, having your exams before the winter break, but then having additional class time that first week after winter break, that might be enrichment or something. So you're not in that situation of kids having to wait through the entire break you know, to take that final, or in the case of certain students that, um, that I've known, um, living in dread for, you know, the, the 10 days or two weeks of winter break because they know what's coming <laughs> at the end of it, um, and yet not changing the schedule so significantly. Um, so those are options that I think are going to be discussed. To me, what's more exciting and more interesting is uh, the discussion of what, what finals are for, um, because I think to many of the students, finals are just this thing to be dreaded. Um, they don't do anyone any good. They'll make your parents really angry, and they give you something to stress out about over winter break. Well, in general, as we move to, some, to more formative assessments instead of summative assessments, you're testing kids to see what they know and help them learn the parts that they don't yet know. So does a final exam help with that? No, it really doesn't. Um, I think we discussed in our meeting a little bit um, about how much more valuable por portfolio projects are because it's more of, um, of a way of assembling and compiling and reviewing everything that you did learn over the semester rather than just sort of a one and done today, right now, what do you remember? Um, and I know that there are many classes where, that, where there is a, either a final project or a portfolio project that goes into their final grade. So I, I kind of think that that's where we're going with that. Um, which perhaps wouldn't end up changing the, the calendar dates at all. Um, so it just, you know, needs more discussion. I'm quite excited to, well, I'll be off the board, but I'll be interested to hear how those discussion go, discussions go. And I know Ms. Fagel is, is very, very interested in pursuing that path, and Mr. Rogers as well. So I think that's what we're going to hear a little more about. But I agree that having a little more information about what neighboring districts are doing gives us some context. So thank you. Okay, uh, board members, uh, Mr. Powers, do you have a report for the Finance and Operations Committee? Uh, finance and Operations did not formally meet uh, since the last board meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled in March. Okay, and uh, while you're not formally listed here on the agenda, and there are a couple of uh, issues uh, coming up later in the action items, uh, Mr. Mormon, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you so choose to comment on the Policy Committee. Uh, I don't know whether there were any areas that require further discussion or uh, uh, m most of the policy uh, committee matters were um, legislative uh, compliance type issues that we really uh, had to go along with and we handled those we did spend quite a bit of time talking um, about alcohol testing and um, we, we referred that back to uh, legal counsel to get a little more uh, direction and feedback yeah, and we'll uh, have another uh, uh, policy meeting uh, prior to uh, April you know to further implement uh, what, whatever we uh, uh, derive and then Mr. Simic I'm not sure if you had a chance to talk to uh, legal counsel 
I did not, but Dr. Wilcox has spoken and will report that out um, uh, to the board uh, in, the, in the week ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ted, and uh, I'd just like to express my appreciation as one who graduated from the Policy Committee. It may not be the most glamorous <laughs> role in the world, uh, but it's a very necessary role, and uh, I appreciate your taking charge of it. Moving on then, uh, are there any liaison reports from NSSED or elsewhere? Uh, yes, the NSSED, um, since the last NSSED meeting, we did have a tri-district uh, meeting with uh, District 65, 67, and 115. And ongoing concern uh, seems to be, as we're trying you know, um, to create the least restrictive uh, environment for the students and as part of that we're bringing more and more uh, students back in-house and you know locally and as we do that we're finding um, that we're really financing more and more and as we become a, a more or a lower user of NSSED services uh, we find that, that basically our tuition bill seems to be uh, an ongoing issue and that, that will be uh, you know, a continuing effort as we try to restructure um, the way NSSED uh, does build the uh, consortium members. And the next NSSED meeting is tomorrow evening in, in Highland Park, if anyone's in interested in attending. I'll be there, but I haven't been able to get anyone else to come along. <laughs> um, but Thanks. along with that, we are getting ready to start a superintendent search. Um, our superintendent leaves after the 15-16 uh, school year. That's the NSSED superintendent, so there's no yes, reason. Just to, make to the best of my knowledge, unless Mr. Simic hasn't told me something. But. Thank you, Ted. That's all I have. Any, any other reports, Ed Red or otherwise? Okay, hearing then, let's move on to the action items uh, because I suspect they're going to require some level of discussion. I see Mr. Albus at the ready. Uh, board members, I would point out here before we get started, uh, when we get to the point of making a motion, uh, I'm informed that we have to read certain exact language in order to, fee to fill the legal requirements. So uh, whoever would like to move, I have said language if you all don't, and I'd appreciate it if you'd read it as written. So thank you. Mr. Albus. Thank you. In December of 2006, the district issued voter approved bonds in the amount of $53.9 million to fund facility improvements at East Campus and here at West Campus. The bonds have a 20 year repayment schedule and are recallable after 10 years, so in 2016. Over the past year, Elizabeth Hennessy from William Blair has updated the Finance and Operations Committee on market conditions and strategies to take advantage of the current conditions and to reduce the overall cost of the remaining bonds. And I'd like to point out something here. These, because these are voter approved bonds, this is a tax that's levied annually by the county directly on homeowners. So any savings, and that's what we're talking about here tonight by refinancing, accrues directly to homeowners. It doesn't gener generate more money for the school district um, in any way. And those savings come in the form of lower future assessments. Uh, for, lower future right, for the debt portion on the tax bill of the school district. So over the past year, we've really, in, in committee, talked about three different strategies in regard to the refinancing of bonds. The first one, even though the call date isn't until the end of 2016, is to refinance them now. There are ways to do that. But in doing that, we would incur a significant amount of what's called negative arbitrage, and that would really eat in to the savings generated. Even in that scenario, though, we're talking about generating $4 million of savings over the remaining life of the bonds. So that's very attractive to look at. Another strategy was to wait and continue to monitor the market until we get closer to the call date, because as we get closer to that date, the amount of negative arbitrage gets reduced, so the savings become greater. But that's a, that's a year and a half away. 
and a lot can happen in that time with interest rates. A third strategy is, is kind of blending a little bit of both. Take a portion of the debt that's out there now that's considered bank qualified, meaning it's under $10 million, and refinance that sometime in this calendar year and continue to monitor the market for the other portion of debt and try to take that as close to the call date as seems feasible. And what I mean by that, if we see conditions changing where rates start going up, then we may want to rethink that strategy. I'll back up to when we initially issued the bonds in 2006, we weren't in what's called a, a negative arbitrage environment. We were actually in a positive arbitrage environment and made money on the bonds, and that triggers a whole different set. Uh, so, so those conditions and those markets change as time goes on. So at our last Finance and Ops Committee, we talked about that third strategy quite a bit, and we looked at the difference between waiting and going now, and, it's, and Liz is going to get up in a moment and kind of walk you through that. But it makes sense to look at taking a portion of that debt sometime this calendar year. But to do that, we have to be ready to take advantage of the market. And so those, the resolutions before you tonight, one is an escrow agreement, and another one is called a parameters resolution that just allows us to act if certain criteria is met without calling a special board meeting or coming back together, because those windows can open and close. So with that, I'm going to invite Liz up. She's going to walk you through each option, and then we can talk about questions with the resolutions um, that are contained in your packet. Thank you, Alan, and thanks for having me tonight. OK, first I'm going to start with a market update. And I'm sorry this graph is so squiggly, but the uh, bottom line is the Fed funds rate. And you can see since the Great Recession really in about 2009, it's been flat almost zero. The green line is the 10-year Treasury, which is very volatile. Um, so you see the ups and downs in the U.S. Treasury, again, just the 10-year. And you can see over the last month heading down downward direction. Um, we hit another all-time low in January of 2013. The blue line is the bond buyer 20 index. So it's a combination of municipal bonds with an average amortization of 20 years. And those rates are higher than the Treasury because it's a 20-year index as opposed to a 10, but it follows the 10-year Treasury. So you can see that line also on a downward trajectory here the, in January in, in this last, um, in our, our first quarter. This chart tells you um, from a historical perspective going back to 1980, where are rates now compared with where they have been since 1980. So the current rate is 3.49 on that bond buyer 20 index. The average since 1980 is 6.26. It's kind of interesting to look back to 1980 and recall when rates were way up in the early 80s and then how they've come down. The graph on the right side tells us what percentage of the time have interest rates been lower than where they are currently at 3.49 on this bond buyer 20 index? And the answer is in the blue bar, 0.5% of the time. We go up to see how, what percent of the time they've been five basis, 10 basis points, 25 basis points higher, and similarly lower. But so rates have been lower, but only 0.5% of the time historically since 1980. And lastly, this is the yield curves, and it compares the yield curves from 2008 to the green line, uh, 2015, as of last Friday. So that green line, you can see, is hanging very low towards our all-time low. The other thing to uh, recognize about this line is how low those short-term interest rates are. So in years one through five, you know, we're really close, uh, under 1% in terms of interest rates. 
These indexes are the AAA Municipal Market Data Index, again the yield curve showing interest rates from years 1 through years 30. So this is for uh, a basket of securities that are made up of the strongest AAA rated states in the union. So these are the, the highest grade credits. Okay, so Alan um, did a really nice job of talking about the three different options. Now I'm worried because I'm not sure you all can see that perfectly. Um, but option one, and um, I do have some handouts that uh, we can hand out. Thanks, Alan, if it's too small. Is refunding all the bonds in advance of the call date now. Oh, okay, laser pointer, great. Okay. Thanks, Alan, sorry. So, Alan was mentioning the 2006 bonds, and they were for $54 million approved by the voters back in 2006. $36,155,000 of those bonds are callable prior to their maturity. So those are the bonds that we can refund for savings. Option one is if we were to go ahead and refund the whole thing in spring of 2015 right now, based on interest rates um, last a few weeks ago, or actually in January at our finance and ops meeting. Savings, in this case, is four million, just under four million two. The thing to notice, though, is this negative arbitrage, which Alan was mentioning. This is what I look at as an opportunity cost. It's 922,000, and what that represents is the the mismatch between the investment of the bond proceeds in an escrow, which will mature at the call date on 11-1-2016, and what the yield on the bonds are. So if short-term yields were higher, this number would go to zero and the savings would go into your uh, total savings number. But because short-term interest rates are so low and we're required to invest the bond proceeds in that escrow in Treasury securities, we can only earn a very, very low rate of return on that. So what that forces us to do is issue a little bit more bonds than we otherwise would, which drags the savings down. So these are your net savings. You don't have to do any subtraction here, but this 922 represents an opportunity cost. If we waited to the call date and rates were the same, we would have access to. Now let's go to option three. So if rates in September of 2016, about 90 days before the call date, so we can do that refunding so the bonds can get paid off at the call date, are the same as they are today, and uh, we were able to do this refunding, the savings would be 5728 So that seems like, a, uh, you know, gee, we should probably wait. The problem is we don't know what interest rates are going to do between now and uh, 2016. So what we come up here with is a break-even. So the, the answer to the question, how much would interest rates have to go up by 2016 to make me better off to refund the bonds now rather than wait, the answer to that question is 75 basis points or 0.75%. Okay, so that's just under 1%. It could happen or it could not happen. We've been waiting for interest rates to go up for years and they just haven't. However, we hear lots of talk among our Federal Reserve that with positive uh, economic indicators. The employment number that came out last Friday was uh, positive, uh, especially when they revised the prior month's unemployment number. looked really good. It made the Treasury bond market uh, sell off and yields went up in the Treasury bond market 20 basis points in a day. Okay, So then the Fed starts thinking maybe sooner on the rate increase, maybe later. So we've got a lot of guessing out there. So what we look at is a third option, which is option two, to maybe take a portion of that interest rate risk off the table by refunding a small portion of the bonds 
in 2015. Um, so what we would suggest with regard to this is issue is refunding less than 10 million of bonds. Why? Whenever you issue 10 million or less of bonds in a calendar year, you can issue them as bank qualified. What that means is banks have an incentive to buy your bonds because the federal government gives them an extra deduction of, uh, of interest on their tax return. So they get a break for buying the bonds of small issuers who sell less than 10 million principal amount in a calendar year. So that is worth about five to 10 basis points, um, which is, uh, is worth something in today's market. So option two is to sell the, these bonds in 2015, come back then in 2016, and sell the balance. So then we ask our question again, waiting till 2016 at current interest rates gives us that 5.7 million. How much would interest rates have to go up to result in this total savings number in option two, which is a 5.5 million, so it's about $200,000 less. And the answer to that is only 10 basis points, okay? Because this is the biggest part of the issue. It's very s sensitive to interest rates. So if we move the whole curve up 10 basis points, our savings uh, doing it all in 2016 instead of 5.7 million would be 5.5 million. So in our opinion, that 10 basis points is very small and can happen quickly. So let's see. So that's why we're bringing you this option of this 10 million bank qualified. Um, just a few more things um, on the strategy. The 10 million bonds, we're looking at refunding the bonds that come due in the next five years for that small bank qualified portion. And the reason for that is, is because remember that yield curve? The interest rates in those first five years are the absolute lowest they've been. They're under, you know, right around 1% on um, the AAA MMD. So the idea being we take advantage of those low interest rates on the yield curve with our refunding, hitting the bonds that are coming due just in the next five years and leaving the juicier uh, refunding bonds for the current call date in 2016. Um, now, the resolutions you have in front of you, you have a parameters refunding bond resolution and escrow resolution um, to refund a bank qualified portion uh, of under 10 million. Now, the parameters resolution authorizes delegates of the board, uh, the board president, and uh, the deputy superintendent to give the final okay on the refunding of the bonds. So we have flexibility with timing within calendar year 2015. Um, and the only complication to this is that you have a board election coming up in April. So this parameters resolution is really good just up until the board election. So if market doesn't cooperate and we don't get this refunding done and we feel it's better to wait, we would might be back to you in May with the same authorization. Um, but we thought it would be important given what we've seen in the first two months of uh, 2015 here with these incredibly low interest rates to be ready to capitalize on the opportunity. Okay, so the next decision that, you know, Alan and I have been talking about um, is within 2015, what is the best time to issue bank qualified bonds? And there's really three times a year that are, that are super good. One is in the January timeframe. A lot of bonds mature January 1, so there's a lot of money looking for reinvestment. So that's purely from a demand from municipal bonds point of view, that January and February is a good time. Um, April's generally not a good time. People are paying taxes and not looking to invest money. Uh, then we come to July 1. June and July 1 are also interest payment dates and some maturity dates too. So I think that's a good consideration. And then finally, December 1. As time goes on, we have some negative arbitrage in this bank qualified refunding too. As time goes on, that bank 
that uh, negative arbitrage gets smaller the closer we get to the call date. So weighting is an advantage that way too. So we did an analysis for you looking at three possible issuance timing scenarios. The first one is issuing the bonds right now. And here we've got about 431,000 of savings. You can see how the bonds only go out to 2020. Again, first five years hitting that low uh, interest rate area of the yield curve. Um, the annual average savings is about 86,000. Net present value, 422. We look at uh, present value savings as a percent of the bonds refunded. And let me just mention here that all these savings numbers are all net of any cost of issuance. Um, on the bonds. So the PV, uh, present value uh, savings as a percent of the bonds refunded ratio is 4.71%, and the minimum refunding target in, in the industry is 3%. So this tells us it's well above that 3%. The other uh, number we look at is refunding efficiency, which takes into consideration the negative arbitrage, the 79% on the March option. Um, so we'd like to see that over 70%, and it is. So these r numbers were run last week with interest rates of last week. Next, we look at July. So if you look at the negative arbitrage number in the March run, it's at about, there's my pointer, 112,000. In the July run, it's 99,000. In the December run, it's 81,000. Okay, so you see how that negative arbitrage gets burned down and it results in more savings. We've used the exact same interest rates in all these three scenarios. So then we have to ask ourselves the break-even question again. Are we better off issuing now or issuing in July? So if we issue in July and interest rates go up by 10%, the savings will be the same as in the March option, 431. Similarly, we ask ourselves that same question about waiting till December. We want to wait till December because we get lower negative arbitrage. We can refund more bonds, more efficient. However, if interest rates go up by 25 basis points, 0.25% by December, the savings, which is 514, would be the same as the savings in March. So after talking this through and, and considering it, I was ready to come with you, uh, to you with a recommendation to issue now a pass this resolution, and we would try to get ready to issue now in March. Given that 10 basis points is easy to go up, we just lost 10 basis points or, or 7 basis points on the short end of the curve uh, with this an unemployment thing. Um, 25 basis points, as you know, the Fed when they increase rates, they increase that federal funds rate, okay? So it's a very short-term rate, but typically they do it in 25 basis point increments. So if they increase by the fall, this certainly could happen too. So um, we think it's important to be authorized and be ready in the ready position to go. I will tell you we ran the numbers at the end of today and just from last week to today, we're down to about 400,000 savings so we lost a bunch with that unemployment number. So I'm, I'm not recommending we go right now. Let's just take it day by day and see what happens next week. We've had tons of global instability and negative things going on globally. The crisis, debt crisis in Greece. These destabilizing factors make investors rush towards quality investments, the number one of those being U.S. Treasury bonds. The more demand for U.S. Treasury bonds, the higher the price, the lower the rate. Municipal bonds follow that. So just based on what's happened the first two months here, 2015, I think we're going to be in store for more of that uh, negative global pressure. Um, whether it offsets some positive economic factors here in the U.S. enough to cause our bond market to uh, tighten up a little bit, we'll see. But I do think it's in the district's best interest to be authorized so that we can take advantage of these markets on this bank qualified issue. Any questions? Yeah, Liz, thank you very much. Um, 
you know, just a couple top of mind comments uh, for the board and, and those of you that are at home as well. Um, you, you've heard me talk about this before. Um, and when I had the privilege of taking over the Finance and Operations Committee from Mr. Block, um, one of the things that we highlighted early in this calendar year, or this board year, was that we were going to keep watching this. And I think one of the comments I also made is, rest assured at home, I'm not the only one watching it. We have some really talented, capable folks that do this for a living that are giving us the appropriate guidance and counsel. Um, Ted and I and Dave, who, who are sitting board members on this committee, um, talked about it in the last two board meetings. And, and one of the things that we, we all kind of agreed upon, and I even made some comments at the last board meeting uh, from the minutes and notes uh, for the meeting that I missed that, that Dave led for us was we didn't really feel any pressure to do anything and it looked like it was favorable for us to sit and wait. Um, well, a couple things. Um, I think there's meaningful, uh, there's meaningful evidence and, and I think the time is on our side to, uh, to put ourselves in a position to be able to respond quickly which is really what the request to us as board members are and, and what we're really, um, we wanna make sure we communicate to the, to the community we're trying to do is kind of be go for launch, right? And there's some things that we need to do, some formalities that we need to take that make sure that we're, we're in that position. Um, I think a, a parameters resolution is just smart. Um, Alan and I talked about this this week. I, I think it's something, and, and you'll see us probably come back because uh, as Liz pointed out, we do have this one little technicality because we will have a new sitting board. Normally, these parameter resolutions go for six months. We're, you know, we're going to really have one for three because we'll have a new, we'll have a new board sit at some time, seating sometime in April. Um, and my recommendation is that this will come back for that new board to buy us time. But the last thing that I want to mention um, that seems to be kind of the real tipping point for me and not like we need a whole lot more evidence, but it's really kind of the market's at an all-time low. And, and there is savings for the taxpayers and it makes it reasonable for us to do this. Um, I've also made the comment in the past that had this, if this were my own money, I may be more of a gambler than, than I would be with, with the community's money and the taxpayers' money. Um, but I think we're in a great position. I think with Liz and Alan watching this, you know, uh, almost daily and having certainly very frequent conversations about where we are uh, and what the opportunity is and, and are all the stars aligning to help us be put in a position to capitalize on this. I think we're in a great spot. So uh, just kind of my two cents worth and appreciate what you guys are doing and, and certainly leave it up to the rest of the board to, to add their comments. Uh, a technical question, Liz. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, this parameters resolution only being effective until the board election in April. Uh, is it effective until the board election, or is it effective until the new board is seated, which will likely be the first week in May? That's a good question, Dick. I think, and I'll double check on it and get back to you tomorrow for sure, that Chapman and Cutler, who's our bond counsel and is very conservative on this, would say that it's probably effective until the election date, even though the board is going to be seated later. But I will double check. Yeah, because on that. The, the sitting board still retains complete authority okay, until okay. the new board is seated. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not advocating that we do something in any way, yeah. you know, untoward or bending or the rules or what have you. But I suspect what you'll find is that it. You know, it would it would be valid until the new board is seated. But why don't you check on that and I let will. us know? I will. I will. Thank you. Uh, I tend to agree with John uh, that we ought to be prepared. Uh, as uh, Liz, you point out, uh, we've lost some ground here just uh, recently. Uh, we need as much runway as we can get, and unfortunately, we're not going to have a lot. Uh, but you know, the bureaucracy takes time to to move. Maybe you could comment on that even, but. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to be safe here with, with the with the taxpayers' money here, as opposed to being risky, as you pointed out, and 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 hoping for a home run down the road when we could pocket 
uh, sort of the majority of it now. Uh, and just to your comment on the runway we need, um, we've already gotten a little bit in the ready position. We've got an official statement put together. We had our rating interview with Moody's today. And so we should get that back next week and we'll just be in the ready position then. This is really the, 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 mo the last formal process that we need to allow us to go should the market conditions be right. It's so a 24 hour trigger or is this a 48 hour trigger? Is it a two week trigger or is it a two month trigger? It's, That's what it's I'm about looking. a week really. You know, if, if things are looking good at the end of this week, let's say we're having a rally or something, I would mail the POS, we get the rating next week, and I'd say it's within a week. We need to market for about a week. Um, the district is an incredibly strong credit. There's a good appetite for your bonds out there. So I, I think a week is, is really our launch time. Okay. Uh, fellow board members, any questions of Ms. Hennessy uh, of uh, join? piggyback what, what both of you have uh, said and just to reiterate, um, I think it is wise to be ready at any given uh, point. So yeah, I'm in full agreement that we go ahead and uh, proceed you know, with both of the, the parameters. That, yeah. Just so if it is time to pull the trigger, you know, we, we can do it with the least amount of red tape To quickly summarize this, because it's buried in one of the 100 pages that we gave you with the escrow agreement, but when Liz was talking about the bonds that we're looking to retire, the scheduled rate on those is four and a quarter, 5%, 5%, 5%. So we're looking at the current market rates. And, and this is from today. On, up here, it's 1.47 is your all in true interest cost because we've had market movement from Friday we're at about 1.63 at the end of today in terms of your all-in true interest cost. So, I mean, that's pretty good <laughs> compared to what you're paying. Any further questions, board members? Uh, I, I, would wake, I would make one more comment before we uh, call for a uh, motion. Uh, as much time as you professionals can give the board to consider something that's reasonably complicated like this. I think the better off uh, we are. And uh, so I just, I just make that comment. And I note that the meeting took place in January and uh, the board members got the package last week. So uh, just always keep in mind, not all of us are as fluent in this language as, as you all are. And we appreciate the benefit of time. So. Is there a motion to approve the parameters of resolution? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education adopt the resolution providing for the issue of not to exceed $9,900,000 general obligation refunding school bonds series 2015 of the district for the purpose of refunding bonds of the district providing for the levy of a direct annual tax sufficient to pay the principal and interest on said bonds and authorizing the sale of said bonds to William Blair and Company LLC. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. So any further discussion, board members? Can we have a roll call, Ms. Barrett? Please? Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. S Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. <coughs> Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. And uh, now on to the, uh, the second piece of the puzzle, so to speak. Do we need another motion? Is there any further discussion, uh, Alan or Liz? No? Okay, fine. And this, just so you know, is related to the bond resolution. It authorizes a bank to hold and escrow those funds until the call date, the bond proceeds until the call date. The funds from the new issue? The funds from the new issue? Correct. Yeah. Everybody understands, I presume, that we're talking about issuing new bonds at a much lower interest rate to raise money to pay off the old bonds, which are at a higher interest rate. So. Okay. Uh, 
I'm happy to entertain a motion uh, regarding adoption of the escrow agreement. I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education adopt the resolution authorizing and directing the execution of an escrow agreement in connection with the issue of not to exceed $9,900,000 general obligation refunding school bonds series 2015 of the district. Thank you, Nikki. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion, board members? Mrs. Barrett, a roll call vote. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. And we now move on to the next action item, the approval of the Crisis Go uh, app. Before we move on, thank you very much, uh, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for your advice. All right, and with that, uh, Mrs. Fagel, would you like to introduce the Crisis Go app? So in your packet, you have information regarding a new technology that's available to school districts that is an added layer of protection um, during crisis management. And it's really important to understand that it is not replacing our crisis management management procedures and protocols that are constantly being updated and reviewed in collaboration with the Lake Forest Police Department. This is an added layer um, that could really um, make more efficient our ability to communicate. So the idea with the app is that in a crisis situation, everyone, including our students, is likely to grab their phones before anything. So even before the clipboard off the wall or the classroom keys in the purse, it's become a part of our, our lives. So on the phone with the app, teachers, support staff, any staff member in the district can opt to have access to the app on their personal cell phone device, and that will give them multiple capabilities um, in a crisis situation, ranging from access to student and parent contact information up to the minute attendance information, videos from central office or from the police department could be pushed out onto the app. It also gives any adult the ability to um, signal to the school community that there is a danger in the building without having to get to a phone or a PA system. Um, we feel very confident in rolling this out slowly. It would start this spring with just the leadership team getting used to it and then a full rollout in the spring. It would be across both districts. Um, our partners in Lake Bluff are, have already begun to use this so we can learn with them as well. And we're also very comfortable with the um, financial cost. It's reasonable. It's something we feel that we can absorb in our current budget across the two districts uh, by student and then also continue to sustain going forward. Dr. Ingrid Weimer, and then um, who is the Executive Director of Student Services in District 67, is working closely with Scott Craniac at the high school um, and has kept us all in the loop. And um, the deans as well have seen this and everyone feels that, that it's really just a win-win. Um, it's important to know that while the app allows our student information data to be accessed, two things. First of all, that is still our data. We're not turning our data over to, for example, Crisis Go. It's our data. As it's transferred, okay, it's encrypted. It's protected. And the third party vendor that does that transfer is named Clever. And they are known and respected as a FERPA compliant vendor, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So this is not something where we feel that our students' personal demographic uh, family contact information would be at risk in any way, shape, or form. I uh, was going to ask about data security, and it sounds like um, 
that pretty well addresses it. In all that fine print that I, you know, that I asked for, yes. um, they do say that they have the the vendor has the right to use our data in the aggregate, de-identified, and so I was wondering if that meant any any of our student data. It sounds like no, because yeah. they won't ac ever actually have that in their in right. their possession. The data they're more interested in using is more of the. Um, the process usage data during the crisis situation. So they're improving their product based on each time any organization uses the app. So how many um, how many teachers accessed information? Was a video pushed out? The other piece that's on there that's super cool is all of the exit entrance building maps in like a really technologically nice clear way to access so again you're not like looking up at the you know trying to it's it's all right there i'm sorry nikki go ahead no i that i think that covers any concerns i might yeah. have had one thing that does seem really valuable is um as you say in in your memo um, student rosters and attendance capabilities so if everyone has to evacuate the school right the teachers have in their hand their their student roster and can and know who who was there that day and who exactly. was not there that day and they'll be able to make sure that all right. students are accounted for and it's also i mean it's one thing for teachers to have the class in front of them but we when we think about kids during free periods kids on field trips kids who have left for a doctor's appointment and come i mean there's all those unknowns that again if if we're doing a good job in each building taking attendance, which sounds like a small thing, but it's actually a really big thing, um, then that capability to have that up to the minute accurate information is crucial in, in a crisis situation. And I imagine that the panic button capability is a comfort to a great many people. Mm -hmm. And it takes several creative touches and taps to make it go so that you don't accidentally um, there won't be any like butt dialing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's uh, <laughs> kind of funny, but not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we're we're excited about the capability, and again, we feel that it's an added layer of protection that I think in the end will probably become more the norm, and it gives every adult the ability to be proactive in an emergency situation instead of just the people who are trained who are often out of the building. So it's. It's, it's a good thing. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize the questions here, but uh, I assume then that staff has some sort of training to aid, aid their judgment as right. to what is an emergency that warrants the use of this. Exactly, exactly. So again, we'll do a soft rollout with our leadership teams across the districts this spring, and then a full rollout with staff in the fall accompanied by training. So Lauren, that was my question. Is this the soft launch primarily because of the training curve mm -hmm. the learning curve you just mm -hmm. don't feel that everyone can grasp it all quickly without having some experts in-house just looking at the calendar in front of us in the limited amount of time and this is not something that we feel we can offer like a webinar on or something we feel like people need that face-to-face -face. and once we once we make it available we think everyone's going to who's going to want it will want it and um, we don't anticipate having the proper amount of time and, and have people be at a comfort level where they'd feel they'd feel okay having it yet. Um, if things go very well with the soft rollout and we have an opportunity where it still feels like it makes sense before the end of the school year, we, we could consider that. But right now we're thinking a um, opening two days type of training session for staff. Now, it wouldn't take two full days, but during that time. <laughs> Nowhere close to two days. <laughs> So this, um, the point where it syncs with our school staff is um, in attendance primarily? Right, so it will talk to PowerSchool, which is our student information system, and that has all of our attendance and family contact information. So as you know, our kids are communicating before we are about a crisis, and so this, this kind of allows us to, again, from the district office to just push out communication um, and try to keep anxiety levels down, which is really your number one goal in any type of crisis. I, first, I really appreciate that we continue to look at opportunities for improving the safety and never rest on where we're at. Mm -hmm. So number one, I applaud that for everyone that's been involved in it. Uh, in terms of what you commented on earlier regarding FERPA and who owns the data and some of those um, complexities. Uh, it's great to hear that you've already looked into that and validated that. 
I presume that it's, it's actually called out in black and white in one of the contracts, and if not, that we're making sure that that level of detail is there's contractual mm -hmm. obligations. Yes. Okay, terrific. Yep, so we've reviewed the fine print, and we'll also make sure with legal counsel that, that it's all okay, but in researching both that, that connecting vendor, Clever, um, and also the idea that whatever aggregate data they're collecting is more for process, it's not for students, um, it's not personally identifiable information. Um, and any further questions, you know, as we learn, we can continue to just make sure that we're on top of that. I know in the contract it talks about the company having the opportunity to change its policies without notifying the district, but that is separated apart from how our data is transferred and, and who gets to keep it. Any further yeah, questions? Yeah, m m just one. Uh, now that it, Crisis Go has com come out with these additional um, features or uh, app, is there any talk about the instant alert system um, coming out? Uh, you know, with these type of features, you know, to make you know keep themselves relevant. So the you mean the constant contact, the one that we use to make yes, all the phone exactly. calls. Two different systems. No, the the Honeywell, right? The instant alert, I think, is what he was talking about. Yeah, I think if I can paraphrase that, it, an interest I had, and I decided to ask about it privately. But I think it's a, a natural extension uh, to wonder: is there going to be something future that would alert the parent base, maybe even the student base directly? Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know about exits and protocols and. Mm fundamentally what's going on so uh, I, I know we have the the telephone based system right, but right. I, I also know a lot of uh, universities as a for instance have a, a text or you know a mobile based alert system right so. so parents can currently get the messages on their cell phone but I would guess just like with anything that's only gonna, we're only going to see more and more options for instant communication with parents I'm not sure if Crisis Go themselves offers the capability. We don't want our parents having the app to alert, you know, for a crisis, but certainly to be able to get that instant communication. Um, so we'll definitely be watching to see what they offer and develop. Um, right now, this is their focus, though, with the school staff. Yeah, don't be surprised if your phone lights up tomorrow with parents wanting the, just the attendance information for their kids. <laughs> <laughs> they want to check and see if they're really in school. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Ted? Is it? Uh, partially, well, I was also wondering about the the, the system we currently have in place. So Are they, they serve talking about upgrading, to right? Offer similar features. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's a, that you're you're thinking ahead, Ted, in terms of what could come next, where the two systems start to merge, and perhaps one vendor would offer the same services, and we could just kind of consolidate that way. But right now, they're two separate systems, Honeywell, Instant Alert, and then the, the Crisis Go. Okay, that pr pretty much answers my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, board members. If there's, uh, if there's no further uh, questions, can I have a motion, please? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the, Chris, the Crisis Go app as presented. Second. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Schreiber and Mormon. Uh, Mrs. Barrett, roll call, please. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Snowblund? Aye. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Barrett, uh, which brings us to the approval of the press 80, issue 87 policy update. Uh, Mr. Simic or Mr. Mormon, do you want to make any introductory comments? No, I didn't believe uh, what I said before still applies, so. I think the package is fairly self-explanatory. The changes are all driven by either uh, legal or regulatory uh, uh, driven uh, situations. So are there any questions, board members, or comments on the package? If not, can I will entertain a motion to approve? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education waive the first reading of press issue 87 policy updates. Second. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess 
technically speaking, we do have to have a, a, a motion to waive uh, first reading. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's what the motion seat provides, which I didn't look at before I asked for the motion to approve. So can I first have a motion to waive the first reading? Did you, did you read that? Am I, am I behind the times? Okay. A roll call, Mrs. Barrett. Thank you. Mr. Another. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Thank you for keeping me straight. Now I'll entertain a motion to approve the press issue 87 policy updates. I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve press issue 87 policy updates on second reading. Second. Thank second. you, Mr. Markison. Thank you, Mr. Mormon. Again, Ms. Barrett, a roll call vote. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, which brings us to uh, approval of the press five-year policy updates. Uh, any comments or discussions, board members? I think it's a very similar situation. I'm going to go first with approval to waive. Thank you. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion for approval to waive the first reading. I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education waive the press five-year policy updates first reading. Second. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Barrett. A roll call, please. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And now for approval of those same five year policy updates, uh, second reading. Is there a motion? I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the press five year policy updates on second reading. Second. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Barrett, roll call vote, please. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, which brings us to approval of the Human Resources Report. Is are there any comments from staff on the Human Resources Report? Again, seems fairly straightforward. Uh, any comments, board members, or questions? I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the Human Resources Report as presented. Second. Second. Thank you. That would be on first reading. Mrs. Barrett, can we have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Black? Mr. Black? Aye. Motion passes. That was not the result of medication. That was Mr. Simic's interruption there, just for the record. <laughs> okay, that brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, we'll seek approval of the consent agenda unless uh, a board member uh, has any uh, question or reason to want to remove any item from said consent agenda. Are there any questions or uh, needs to remove? Hearing none, I uh, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I move that the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 Board of Education approve the consent agenda inclu uh, items, including approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements from January 2015, minutes of a regular meeting January 13th of 2015, minutes of an executive session January 13th, 2015, minutes of a tri-district board workshop January 22nd of 2015, and disposal of audio recordings July 16th, 2013. Second. Second. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, roll call vote, Mrs. Barrett. Mr. Powers? Aye. Mrs. Sorensen? Aye. Mr. Markison? Aye. Mrs. Snowblin? Aye. Mr. Schreiber? Aye. Ms. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Mormon? Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Motion. Thank you very much. Uh, we had one FOIA request from the Chicago Tribune during the last month. Um, in terms of announcements, uh, 
Friday, February 13th is an institute day and uh, a day of no student attendance. Monday, February 16th is President's Day, uh, there's no school. Uh, Wednesday, February 18th is a late start day, 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, March 4th is another late start day, 9.30 a.m. And our next regular Board of Education meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, here in the West Campus Boardroom. Any further announcements or comments, Board members? Okay, it's now time for us to uh, adjourn this meeting to executive session. We'll formally adjourn both the executive session and the uh, public meeting uh, when we're finished with the executive session, I presume. So uh, I declare this meeting adjourned and we will sit in executive session here in the conference room, I presume, Mr. Simic, uh, until such time as we're done with that agenda. Thank you all very much.